Hello everyone, hello everyone. Good day, good day to everyone, good day. I would like to welcome you all to my channel. Welcome you all to my channel, I'm Dr. Nguyen. And if you like my content, you should just click the subscribe button there and also a thumbs up for me so that I can be motivated even more to provide you with the lessons that I'll be giving you. So welcome you all to my channel. And for today's discussion, for today's discussion, we'll be looking at ectopic pregnancy. Uh, just hold on. I'm sorry for this. So for today's discussion, we'll be looking at ectopic pregnancy. And if you like my content, as I said, click that subscribe button so that we can be moving together. Anytime I've got a lecture, anytime I post something, you can be updated. All right. So welcome you all to my channel and hope we're going to have a very great time together. Okay. So now. Uh, when we are talking about, uh, oh, I hope I've already introduced myself. I'm Dr. Nguira, right? Yes, um, a resident in obstetrics and gynecology. I'm in my third year. Yeah, hopefully by next year I should complete my resident program. So um, I'm somebody who at least knows one or two things in obstetrics and gynecology. And I'm more than willingly to share with everybody on this platform all my contents all my knowledge and also be able to hear what you people are saying be able to uh, learn from you guys so i hope in the process of me presenting my content me teaching you guys you can also be teaching me one or two things all right so you can always throw that comment in that comment button uh, so that we can I can read it in case you've got any lecture that you would like me to explain that you never understood in school. You want me to you want me to lecture it. I'll be more than willing to do that for you guys. So welcome again to my to my channel. So let us go ahead now and talk about ectopic pregnancy. So now, when we talk about ectopic pregnancy, there are things that I would like you to know as we are discussing this topic. By the end of the discussion, I want you guys to be able to to define what an ectopic pregnancy is. I want you guys to be able to understand the function, the histology and the anatomy of the fallopian tubes. I also want you guys to understand the pathophysiology of ectopic pregnancy. You guys you should be able to read, to list some of the risk factors of ectopic pregnancy. Uh, you guys should be able to develop that differential or that, that diagnostic approach. On, on bleeding and abdominal pain and abdominal pains in first trimester you guys should be able to treat the ectopic and also diagnose it man and you guys should be able to do that you guys should be able to understand the uh, the, uh, the pharmacology of ectopic pregnancy so these are some of the things that i would like you guys to learn by the end of this lecture hopefully i will try by all means to be as slow as possible so that you guys can enjoy the content you guys can uh, click that subscribe button you guys can uh, like my content and i can i can be able to learn from you guys and you guys can be able to learn from me so let us go ahead now and discuss this ectopic pregnancy uh, most of the times when i'm teaching people i usually write i usually draw things right i just draw things to make people understand but uh, using the platform that I'm using right now, I'm unable to do that. I haven't yet learned how to do that, but I will learn so that we can have more uh, attractive lessons. So for today, I'm not going to use much of the words. I'll be using pictures because me, I am a drawer. I like drawing things when I'm teaching so that people can understand because I believe people usually retain more when you give them visual kind of lectures compared to typing and all those things so for this lecture i will use mostly i'm going to use uh visual i'll use pictures most i will use pictures and hope you guys can learn one or two things and you guys can teach me one or two things okay so now when we define an ectopic pregnancy i want you guys to look at your screens are you able to see my cursor look at my cursor so now look at this guy i'm drawing here this guy I'm drawing here. So this guy I'm drawing here is called the endometrium. Okay? This guy I'm drawing here is called the endometrium. So when we are talking about ectopic pregnancies, we are simply talking about any pregnancy that would implant 
anywhere outside the endometrial cavity, this one, the endometrium, any pregnancy that does not implant outside the endometrial cavity of the uterus is called an ectopic pregnancy. I have me. I have heard many defini- many definitions. Some people would say when I ask when we are doing a word round, I ask people what is an ectopic pregnancy. Somebody would tell me no, an ectopic pregnancy is any pregnancy that does not implant in the uh, that, that does not implant in the uterine cavity. What do you mean by that? Because even the corneal and the angular of the uterus, those are areas where you can have an ectopic pregnancy. Those areas don't have the endometrium. So when we are talking about an ectopic pregnancy, we are simply saying that it is any pregnancy that does not implant on the endometrial cavity of the uterus. That is an ectopic pregnancy by definition. So now, after defining an ectopic pregnancy, I think we can look at the incidence. You see many countries differ. Some countries, you will find them at 2%. 2% of per 1,000. Other countries are at 1% uh, per 1,000. So with me, I'll just say the incidence of ectopic pregnancy is 1 to 2% per 1,000 pregnancies. So if you are going to use 1%, you are simply saying that you are going to have about 10 ectopic pregnancies per 1,000. That is a very big number. And what you have to understand is that ectopic pregnancy is one of the most leading causes of early pregnancy related mortalities and morbidities if you're caught unaware you may lose this patient so that's why that's why it is very important for us to be able to understand this topic we need to dig deeper into this topic and i'm going to show you how to dig deeper into this topic we are going to dig deeper into this topic so now let's go on so per 1000 incidence is one to two percent all right so now to begin to begin our our discussion we're going to start with a case so we have got a 26 year old here who is a prime gravida or others they call a, a gravida one so this one is a, a prime gravida at six weeks estimated gestation age okay so she comes now and this is you here look at you here you are very sad you are hungry you haven't had your dinner you haven't had your lunch man and this patient comes to you she's sporting and she's having low quadrant abdominal pains and she's crying look at the way she's crying this patient is crying for you and then now you decide to do a better scg so you forgive me i've got a flu so if you hear me uh sneezing bear with me so now you you right there in your emergency department you're very tired you say no i'm gonna do this beta scg now what i want you to understand is that once the beta scg is about 1000 okay milli international units per milliliter if it is 1000 what equal to 1000 or greater than 1000 you expect When you do an ultrasound, you should see an intrauterine pregnancy, okay? So now you have done, this is a patient who has come to you, she's sporting, she's having low abdominal pains, and then you decide to do a beta ICG. Now look at your beta ICG, it's 2,500. So you're expecting that when you do an ultrasound in this patient, you should have a what? You should be able to see an intrauterine pregnancy. So now you you decide, okay, now let's do an, an ultrasound. Now you do this ultrasound. Now look at the ultrasound. Are you able to see my case? Sir? Now look at your ultrasound. This is your uterus. Look at this uterus. There's completely nothing in this uterus. Now you start wondering what is happening to this patient. Because this patient has got already a beta ICG which is greater than 1000. So I'm expecting to see something inside this uterus, but you're not seeing anything inside this uterus. So now you say, no, let me just try and check other areas. So you decide to check the adnexus of the ut- of the abdomen. You decide to check the adnexus of the abdomen. Now you find this guy. Look at this guy. Look at this guy. Huh? You decide to, to check this guy. And then that guy is called the ovaries. So you decide to look at the ovaries. You see that the ovaries are there. You, you are able to see the ovaries, sorry. You are able to see the ovaries, and then on, on the ovaries, you see this guy, look at this mass here. 
from the ovaries, this mass. Okay? You see this mass. So, and then you've got this. You have got this. We call it the the firing sign. We call it the firing sign. So you've got this firing sign, and then you've got this guy. You've got this guy, a mass in the ovaries. And then you've got a beta ACG greater than 2,500. What is that telling you? This could be an ectopic pregnancy. So you say, mm-hmm. all these things, they're pointing towards an ectopic pregnancy. So now, let us now try to dig deeper into an ectopic pregnancy. Let us try and under, and, 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 and understand an ectopic pregnancy. So now, uh, we have defined an ectopic pregnancy as any pregnancy that would implant anywhere outside the endometrial cavity of the uterus. Now, the sites of an ectopic pregnancy, the most common site of an ectopic pregnancy is the fallopian tube. It accounts for about 95% of all ectopic pregnancies. Okay? Now, the remaining 5% would occur either in the abdomen, on the ovaries, on the cervix, and also on cesarean section scars. So now, since 95% of these ectopic pregnancies are occurring where? In the fallopian tube. So it is high time we try to understand what is so special about these fallopian tubes. So this is now where we try to understand the functionality of the fallopian tubes, the histology of the fallopian tubes, and also the anatomy of the fallopian tubes. Because these are usually very important even when you are doing your clinical rounds, if you are doing it with your consultants, you are doing it with your registrars or your um, your residents, they will ask you these questions. So now, what are the functions, the histology, and also the anatomy of the fallopian tubes? So now, let's go deeper and dig deeper. So now, you see, the fallopian tubes are made up of fingers, okay? Just like you and me. We have got fingers, right? I, I usually think fimbria comes from fingers. <laughs> because what is the purpose of our fingers? We usually use it to capture. We get food, we eat. We use a spoon to eat. We are using our fingers to capture that full spoon so that that spoon can also capture the food and then we eat it. So now, the fumpian tubes has got fingers. These fingers are called fimbrias, okay? So now, the purpose of the fimbrias is to do what? Is to capture that ovulated ovum. That is the purpose of the fimbria. So the first function of the fallopian tube is to capture the ovulated ova. The second function of the fallopian tube is to provide an environment for fertilization. That's the second function. The second function is to do what? Provide an environment for fertilization. And then the third function of the fallopian tubes is now to transport now that fertilized ova to the uterus. So three functions, capture, provide an environment for fertilization, and also transport that fertilized ovum to the uterus. All this should happen within how many days? Within three days, okay? So all these things should happen within three days. Now, I want you to get it very clear because all this will help us understand what an ectopic pregnancy is and how to go about an ectopic pregnancy. So now, after understanding the functionality of the fallopian tube, now we need to understand how is this fallopian tube able to carry out these functions, okay? How is it able to carry out these functions? This is where now we try to understand the histology of the fallopian tube, okay? So now, we have dissected our fallopian tube. This is the fallopian tube is dissected. It has got this inner layer, which we call, this inner layer we call it the mucosa. And then this middle layer here, we call it the muscarinic, and then this outer layer here, we call it the serosa. So now let us zoom in. We zoom in into the mucosa, we zoom in into the muscarinic, and we also zoom in into the what? Into the serosa. So now let's zoom in into the mucosa, and we see what is made up of the mucosa. So now we have zoomed in into the mucosa. Well, now, when you zoom in into the mucosa of the fallopian tube, you see these types of cells. You've got these two my cells with hair. Now I remove my mustache, so I no longer have hair. So those with hair, wherever the hair is, okay? So you just, 
imagine this is the hair of the fallopian tube. This is the mustache of the fallopian tubes. So these ones, we call them the ciliated cells. The functions of these ciliated cells is that they help to propel the fertilized ovum towards the uterus. So once the, the ovum has been fertilized inside the fallopian tubes, these ciliated cells will be propelling. So they help to transport that fertilized ovum to the uterus. That's the function of the ciliated cells. Now, when you look at the peg cells on the other hand, look at these peg cells. The peg cells don't have cilia. They don't have cilia on them. So they are called now secretory cells. So what do they do? They secrete. Okay, that's why they are called secretory cells. So now the peg cells are uh, in this in this chart. Sorry, sorry, sorry. In this chart, I've been able to see some people. So I'm going to use those names. Uh, Madam Ivy, you forgive me for using your name in this uh, tutorial. And also Mr. Elijah, forgive me for using your name in this tutorial. So now, because for us to understand uh, the function of the peg cells, I need to use some um, things that we usually do on a daily basis, okay? So now, let us say I, Dr. Nguira, and uh, Dr. Ivy, or maybe you are, you are still a student, I, Dr. Nguira, and Madam Ivy, uh, we are so intimate, right? We are so in love with each other, right? So now, we are both, we are not yet married, we are still living with our parents. Now our blood is so hot hmm, that we need to do something. We need to do something. So when I and Dr. Ivy decide to go where? Yeah? I and Dr. Ivy, we decide to go to the bush. But we tell uh, Mr. Elijah to escort us, okay? So Mr. Elijah escorts us to the bush so that we can go and burn out the heat inside us. We should go and burn out the heat inside us, right? So now I and Dr. Ivy will reach there in the bush and then we undress and then we start to copulate. And then we tell, I, uh, we tell Elijah that, Mr. Elijah, if you see people coming, ensure that you tell us fast, fast, fast so that we do what we dress up so that we are not embarrassed. Okay? So what is Elijah doing for us? He is protecting us. Okay? He is protecting us against shame and against the people. All right? So that's the function of the peg cells. The function of the peg cell, the first function of the peg cell is that they provide protection to the sperm and the ovum during fertilization. Are we together? That's the function of the peg cells. During copulation, during fertilization, during fertilization, uh, the peg cells provide protection to the sperm and also to the ovum. Okay? Now, the second function of the peg cell, let's say now we have drilled each other, me and Madam Ivy, to a, to, a, to a point that she is so dehydrated and I am so hypoglycemic. Hmm? So now Mr. Elijah has got some water. He gives Madam Ivy the water because she is dehydrated. And then he also gives me some glucose because of that. Because I'm a hypoglycemic. So what is Mr. Elijah doing to us? He's giving us nutrition. Okay? So that's the other function of the peg cells. So the peg cells will provide nutrition to the sperm and to the ovum during fertilization. Remember, the sperm is coming all the way from the vagina. These guys, they usually race, you know, right? The sperm and the ovum, oh, sorry, the sperm is usually race so that they meet the ovum in the fallopian tube. Whosoever will meet the ovum in the fallopian it, it will be the one to fertilize you. So they will race. So just imagine it is racing all the way from the vagina to the fallopian tube. Do you expect it to be dehydrated? Yes. Do you expect it to be hungry? Yes. It will need nutrition for it to carry out the fertilization. It will need water for it to carry out the fertilization because it is so dehydrated. All right, so that's why that's how I want to I want you guys to look at the peg cells. The peg cells will be there to provide nutrition to the sperm. They are providing protection to the sperm. They are also providing nutrition and protection to the ovum during fertilization. All right, so that is the function of uh, the peg cells. So you can see that you can see that uh, the mu the mucosa is very important. 
in this whole process of fertilization okay so now we go ahead to our next layer which is the masculinic layer layer so before we go to the masculinic layer look at this screen these are simply because of food wherever you are wherever you're watching from this whatever it is it could be pink or it could be blue depending on your eyesight these these folds we call them the mucosa folds okay and then this layer here sorry again this layer here is the masculinic layer now the masculinic layer the masculinic layer is made up of two types of cells okay there are two types of cells it has got what we call circumferential cells circumferential and then it has got the longitudinal straight right longitudinal cells uh, longitudinal cells right so when these two contract one will provide circumferential kind of movement the other one will provide longitudinal kind of movements towards the uterus so they will provide this wave-like motion towards the uterus they're providing wave-like wave-like motions towards the uterus so just imagine you are at the river okay you are at the river or you are at the sea or an ocean wherever you are all right and then there are waves going somewhere there are waves let's say waves coming towards you right now if you put a paper on a wave what will happen to the paper it's going to move towards the wave right whatever the wave is going that's where the paper will go right so that's the purpose of this masculinic layer is that they provide wave like motions towards the uterus so they help in movement of this fertilized ovum towards it the uterus by pushing it in a wave like by pushing it in a wave like form in a wave like manner towards the uterus all right so that is the other function of the fallopian tube or the masculinic uh, the masculinic part of the fallopian tube so i hope i had put i hope i've put a picture for you all right okay yeah so look at them these are secular foods foods look at them these are secular or circumferential and then look at these guys, these are longitudinal, right? They're so straight. They're longitudinal. So these are longitudinal layers. So the longitudinal layers and the circular layer and the circumferential layers, when they contract, they will provide this wave-like motion towards the uterus, hence aiding in the transportation of a fertilized over towards the uterus. Are we together? Okay, so that is the purpose of the mascarenic layer. So now if you look at this last layer here, it's so pink. Uh, this is it's all pink right so this layer is known as the serosa okay this layer is uh sorry 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 this layer is known as the serosa so the function of the serosa is to do what the function of the serosa is as it as you can see it is so pink so which means it is rich in blood supply so it is rich in blood vessels so it provides those nutrients to the peg cells and then those peg cells will provide the nutrients where to the sperm and the ovum during fertilization are we together all right so now after understanding the histology of the fallopian tube let us quickly run through the anatomy of the fallopian tube because you'll be asked what are the what are the parts of the fallopian tube so you should be able to quickly answer them the first part of the fallopian tube is the infundibulum so the infundibulum is made up of fimbri here okay and the purpose of the fimbri what did i say capture right so the first part of the fallopian tube is the infundibulum the second part of the fallopian tube is the ampulla okay so look at the ampulla here this is the second part of the fallopian tube this is where fertilization occurs and it is the most common cause or it is the most common area of tubal ectopic pregnancies okay it is the most common area of tubal ectopic pregnancy it accounts for 70 percent of all tubal ectopic pregnancies all right so and then we've got the isthmus here and then the last part is the infundibular so those are the the parts of the fallopian tube you've got there or oh, the interstitial sorry so those are the the parts of the fallopian tube we've got the infundibular the ampulla the isthma and the interstitial those are the areas of the fallopian tube now you may be asked a question which of these areas would which of these areas in terms of ectopic pregnancy which of these uh, parts would result into an early rupture of an ectopic pregnancy is the it's the isthmus okay the isthmus is the narrow narrower 
and since it doesn't have supporting muscles like the interstitium because also the interstitium is narrow but so the interstitium has got the uterine muscles to help to even make it even grow more this ectopic pregnancy but while the isthmus on the other hand it is very narrow that even at six weeks it will easily rupture it is the first thing if you have got an e uh, i hope this english this english is correct if you got an ismo uh, ectopic pregnancy it would easily rupture because it does not have any support and it is very narrow while the interstitial even though it is narrow on the other hand it has got the support it has got the support of the uterine muscles and this type of ectopic pregnancy it even lasts longer than even the ampule it can even last more it even it can even last as much as 12 weeks before you even think of it rupturing while the other types can easily rupture okay so now as you move let me see properly as you move now from the infundibulum towards the interstitium we expect that the cilia and the, the mucosa fold to be decreasing and what is increasing are the smooth muscles so as you move towards the uterus you have more wave like contractions compared to the distal part or compared to the approximal part okay so compared to the eh, fundus okay compared to the to com- sorry, compared to the uh, infundibulum so as you move from the infundibulum towards the uterus as you move from the infundibulum towards the uterus you have less cilia more smooth muscles are we together okay so now let's go ahead so now after understanding the anatomy the histology and the functionality of the fallopian tubes and you have also understood the proper definition of an ectopic pregnancy it's high time we started talking about an ectopic pregnancy but before we even talk further about an ectopic pregnancy there is another topic that i want you guys to understand this is basic knowledge that you should understand because it will help us relate with an ectopic pregnancy okay so now let us say a sperm came here it fertilized this guy okay uh the ovum once the ovum has been fertilized it forms this cell and outside it has got this shell okay it has got, it has got a shell okay so now we call this a zygote okay so we say there's a zygote here so now this zygote has to differentiate from one cell to 16 cells but all this will happen within how many days three days okay so by day three this zygote uh, would, uh, would expect to have uh, a 16 cell molecule by day 3 and it should be right here close to the uterus okay and then you've got the zona pellucidum which is the blue part here outside this the shell we call it the zona pellucidum okay so now by day 4 we expect now this guy to have entered the uterus and then it will be getting some of the fluid from the uterus and then the fluid is going inside here okay so what will be happening is that you are going to have this cell and then you are going to have you have the cell which is the, the zona pellucidum and then you are going to have the trophoblast here and then you are going to have the liquid which it has been able to accumulate which is known as the, uh, the blastocell and then you also have got uh, the inner cell mass this guy here these are inner cell mass so the whole thing here we call it a blastocyst so we expect by day 4 to have the formation of a blastocyst okay now by the 5 by the 5 we expect uh, the endometrium of the uterus to start producing proteolytic enzymes which will start to break down this shell this is zona pellucidum okay by the 5 we expect a breakdown to be occurring okay and then what will, what will happen is that this guy will leak out of this zona pellucidum okay So once it has leaked out of this it will start the process by the 6 to 7 we expect the process of implantation to begin all right so the process of implantation has got three phases okay we've got the phase of apposition where you've got a loose 
connection between the trophoblast and the endometrium. This is where now the trophoblasts are trying to they are trying to see is it this area where I should implant? They are asking themselves, ah, am I supposed to implant here? Is this the right place to implant? So there's that loose connection. So let me go back to Madam Ivy, okay, and myself. Now let's say we are no longer boyfriends and girlfriends. Right now we are married. Okay, we have gone to our honeymoon right now. Okay, now we have decided to we have decided to do our honeymoon from our bedroom. Okay, now it being here in Zambia because me I'm in Zambia, so it being here in Zambia, electricity usually goes a lot. Okay, electricity usually goes a lot, so sometimes we usually have black sheets. Oh, uh, so what will happen is that let's say we have come for our honeymoon in our bedroom. All of a sudden, power goes. Okay, power goes. Oh, what's so bad about this honeymoon? Power has gone. So now, since power has gone, I undress her. Okay, we are making out. I kiss her, and then what is happening is that I undress her. So after undressing her, she undresses me. Now, because I can't see, I can't see right. I'm unable to see that this is the vagina, right? So I'll be there, I'll be there, trying to position myself. There will be that loose connection, okay? So she will be there telling me, no, 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 you are the wrong part, right? You are the wrong part. So I'm trying to position myself so that once we call a position, okay? Or let's say you are still in the dark. Now power has come. Now you are trying to look for a switch, okay? You are trying to look for a switch. Now, that loose connection, you are holding the wall, but you are holding the wall little by little, trying to see, is it, the, where is the switch, where is the switch? So you are very loosely attaching, trying to figure out where the switch is. That, that's what we call a position. So a position is when you've got a loose connection between the trophoblast and the endometria. Okay? So now, after you are found, after I have found the vagina, she tells me that this is the area. What would I do? I will anchor to that place. I will adhere to that place. Okay. That process, we call it the phase of, adhere, of adhering. Okay. So we go to positioning. The second phase is ad, adhering, right? Adhere, you adhere to something, right? So that's the second phase of implantation. Okay, you you anchor to that switch. Okay, you hold on to that switch. Okay, this is the switch now. Oh, here is my charger. You get your charger. This is the switch. You hold on to the switch. Okay, so this is the switch. Okay, then they say the third process we call it as inventing. Okay, that's the third phase of implantation. It is what invasion. I have anchored. I now invade. I I start to invade. Right. So those are the three processes of implantation. When you are asked, what are the phases of implantation? You should know the first one is a positioning, the second one is adhering, and then the third one is what? Inverging, inverting, right? So now, this is it, the phase of a positioning. As you can see, there's loose connection. This is just one trophoblast, which is it. I'm trying to see, okay, is it here? Okay, and then you've got now adhering, Huh? So now it has adhered, right? Huh? This is where now it has anchored. How many have anchored? One, two, three, four, five, almost four. Almost four are anchoring to the endometrium, right? And then the third process is what we call inventing, where they spread inside, right? They invade inside to look for blood vessels. Now, they will ask you, wow, what are some of the types of trophoblasts you know so there are two types of trophoblasts you've got the syncytial trophoblast and the cytotrophoblast the cytotrophoblast usually remains undifferentiated while the syncytial trophoblast on the other hand usually differentiates okay so the syncytial trophoblast is one that differentiates and it invades okay looking for blood vessels and it is also the one which secretes a beta SCG okay which helps in maintenance of the corpus luteum during what during early stages of pregnancy all right so those are the two types of trophoblasts now after understanding 
the definition of an ectopic pregnancy as any pregnancy that is implanting outside the endometrial cavity. We have understood the functionality, the histology and the anatomy of the fallopian tube. It's high time we understood now the what? The pathophysiology of an ectopic pregnancy. Now, I will marry the pathophysiology and also the risk factors and some of the causes right, of an ectopic pregnancy. So now, the pathophysiology of an ectopic pregnancy is as a result of two things. There are two pathways. Either there is a delay or either there is a prevention of passage. Delay or prevention of passage would result into an ectopic pregnancy. Okay, so let's say this guy is fertilized, right? Remember that by day seven, the process of implantation will occur. If something delays this guy to reach the uterine cavity, the endometrial cavity of the uterus, within seven days, it will start the process of implantation, wherever it is going to be. Or if something prevents it, if something prevents this fertilized ovum, from reaching this endometrium on time is going to start the process of implantation which is what it will start a positioning itself wherever it is it will start the process of adhering and then it will start the process of invasion wherever it's going to be okay anything that would cause a delay or, a, or prevent passage of this fertilized ovum to the uterus would result into an ectopic pregnancy so what would cause a delay and prevention of passage is usually abnormal anatomy, okay? Any condition that would result into an abnormal anatomy of the fallopian tube would result in either a delay or prevention of passage. So what are some of the things that would cause an abnormal anatomy? This is now where we talk about it. things such as what? Prio or prior, depending from where you're coming from. Others will say prior, others will say prior. So it's, if somebody has a, had a prior ectopic pregnancy, would have, that would result into a delay. How? How would that result into a delay? Look at my hand, right? It's very smooth here, okay? Let's say here I was to have a wound. I was to have a wound here. Let's say I was to have a wound here. Now, this wound, this part is going to heal now by, by what? In this place, will heal by what? It's going to heal by scarring, right? Yes, it will heal by scarring. Yeah. So, you, I'm going to have a scar here. Do you think that the architecture of my skin will be the same as the architecture, uh, the architecture, uh, the architecture this side? No. So, which means here it will remain smooth. Well, here it's going to remain hard because fibrosis has occurred. So now, if you had a, pre, a prior ectopic pregnancy, it wasn't ruptured, and you just decided to just remove it and suture that area back, they do what we call a salpingostomy, where they remove, they make a small incision, remove the ectopic, and then they suture back. You think that place will remain the same? No, it's going to heal by what? By fibrosis. Now, if it heals by fibrosis, the functionality of that area does not remain the same. So, which means those smooth muscles, which were secular and longitudinal, they are viewed by fibrosis. You think when they contract, they will provide that wave-like motion to aid in transport of the uh, fertilized ovum towards the uterus? No because it is it is hard so they will fail to even contract as a result that would result into a delay in passage of this guy the fertilized ovum towards the uterus okay that's why it is very important to understand the function the histology and that of the fallopian tube so now let's say this patient has got PID. Maybe this PID is due to gonorrhea, it's due to chlamydia. Here in Africa, we even have a lot of TB. Let's say this patient has got a lot of TB abdomen. Okay. Now this patient develop, develops a pelvic inflammatory disease. There's a reason it's called inflammatory. There's inflammation happening inside the fallopian tubes. Okay. So when the fallopian tubes get inflamed, what is happening to the lumen? It is getting smaller. As a result, the, that the passage will become narrower 
and this parochial and this um, this guy here who fail to pass to go towards it, the interest. There will be a delay. And remember, if it delays by seven days, by six to seven, the process of implantation starts. Appositioning, adhering, and invasion. Okay? So, the other thing is that if you have got PID, you usually have adhe adhesions, which are formed inside the abdomen, which will cause twisting of the fallopian tube. If the fallopian tube gets twisted, what is happening? Blockage. They will be, it has got a twisted, so yeah, all that will prevent this fertilized ova to move towards the uterus within the specified days. So if it doesn't move to the uterus within seven days, what will happen? The process of implantation is gonna start. Okay? So you've got other things such as endometriosis and all this salpinio ischemo nodosa. Look at this. This is a patient who deals with salpinio ischemo nodosa. Look at this. This is how it, the Falcon tubes usually look. Let's say this guy is coming. It is coming. It's coming. It reaches here. It gets stuck here for three days. And then all of a sudden it finds its way. It gets stuck again here for another three days. All of a sudden it finds its way. It gets stuck here. There's a delay, right? As a result of that delay, the process of implantation will start. Let's say it has, it has managed to, by the seven to reach here. Right here. It's going to start the process of implantation. And as a result, you are going to have a what? An ectopic pregnancy. Right? So, these are some of the causes and the pathophysiology of an ectopic pregnancy. The other thing is, you know, people who are smokers. Because uh, somebody, somebody is telling me, Doc, uh, we saw that, we saw that, uh, we saw that uh, cigarette smoking is one of the risk factors. How? Okay. Let's say you are a smoker. We go to the airway. The airway is made up of pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium, right? So you go to the, your airway, you are smoking. What is happening to the pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium? It's being converted, right? You are changing from pseudostratified. It stops being ciliated to something else. That's the same that is happening where? In the fallopian tubes. If you are smoking, remember your fallopian tubes. The mucosa part of your fallopian tube is made up of what? Of cilia. So if you are a chain smoker or you are a smoker, what will happen as a female? You will start to convert that cilia into a different cell type. As a result, you lose the functionality of the cilia to be able to aid in propelling or transportation of the fertilized ovum towards the uterus. So that's the other risk factor, which is this cigarette smoking, okay? So I've listed some of the risk factors down here for you, uh, for your reading purposes. Now, a patient, remember our patient that we started with, that's 26 year old who came in with sporting and abdominal pains. So now let's say this, your patient has come in with sporting and abdominal pains in the first trimester. How would you approach them? So how you approach these patients, this is what I've drawn here for you. Somebody who comes in in first trimester with abdominal pains and they are bleeding, I want you to think of three things, okay? first trimester, think of three things. Ask yourself, is this pregnancy viable or is it non-viable or is it an ectopic pregnancy? That's how you approach it. Viable, non-viable or ectopic. If it is non-viable, you think of what? You think of things such as this spontaneous abortion where all your threatening, your complete, your incomplete for under, or you think of a molar pregnancy. On the other hand, if it is viable, you are going to think of uh, it could just be physiological implantation of bleeding. Maybe as the trophoblasts are trying to implant, they are shedding some of the endometrium and then you see it as spotty. It could just be a simple physiological implantation of bleeding or it could be what we call a subchorionic hemorrhage. All those things will discuss them in their own lectures, okay? And then it could be an ectopic pregnancy. So always when somebody comes in with bleeding and abdominal pains in first trimester, ectopic should be part of your differential diagnosis. Are we together? Okay, so now, after we have learned that approach, let us now look at uh, how would you diagnose and treat an ectopic pregnancy? We have talked about the pathophysiology, we have talked about the causes, 
some of the causes how would you diagnose and treat an ectopic pregnancy this is what we are going to discuss right now okay why why, why is this space of texting me mm-hmm. uh, sorry sorry guys uh, sorry for this Sorry, 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 people. Okay, so now, how would you diagnose and treat an ectopic pregnancy? Sorry for that inconvenience. So now, we've got what we call the high index of suspicion. If somebody comes in with amenorrhea, A is from absence, okay? A is from absence. So which means when we say amenorrhea, we are simply talking about absent periods. So if somebody comes with amenorrhea or absent period, they have got abdominal pains, and they've got vaginal bleeding. Start thinking of it of ectopic. It should be part of your differentials. Remember, you should ask yourself viable, non-viable, or ectopic. So ectopic should be part of your differentials. Okay. So now if you are in high resource areas, uh, because here, like where I'm practicing from, it's very difficult to even have a better SCG. We usually take it. If we want a better SCG to be done, we take to a private lab and it's usually costly. So if you are in a high resource area, you can do a better ECG. But what a better ECG will simply tell you is, is it viable, is it non-viable, or is it an ectopic pregnancy? We expect that if it is a viable pregnancy, we're expecting that the better ECG should be increasing by 50%, somewhere 35 to 50%. Okay, so let's say your better ECG was within for 12, 48 hours. So let's say your better ECG was, uh, let's say it was 1,000. So we expect it by 48 hours, we expect it to be at 1,500, 50% rates, right? If it is a viable intrauterine pregnancy. If it is an ectopic pregnancy, on the other hand, yes, it will be raising, but it will not be raising at that rate. It will be raising less than 35%. And then if it is in, an unviable, it won't be raising. Okay? So that's what a better ECG will be helping you. It will be helping you just state whether it is viable, non-viable, it's an ectopic pregnancy. So now, in our areas, we usually use ultrasound. So you can do a transvaginal ultrasound as part of the, your diagnostic tool in uh, checking if patient has got an ectopic pregnancy. So if it shows you You've got those high index suspicions in terms of symptoms, and then you've got your ultrasound, which is showing you, which is showing you uh, there is a there is no any intrauterine pregnancy, but there is presence of an adnexial mass. You start thinking of an ectopic pregnancy. You do your gravity index; it is positive. Suspect an ectopic pregnancy. So, in terms of physical findings, those guys, of, with those, those of you, my friends, who are working uh, in, er- in areas where you've got white people, uh, whose skins you can easily see, there are certain signs that you can check on the abdomen. Uh, what, is this, what does this guy want? Okay. So, there are certain signs that you can... Okay, let me just mute this. Sorry. Okay, so now there are certain signs that you can check. Okay, some of these signs that you can check, there is what we call a Cullen sign. You can check it on the umbilical cord. It is a semicircle. It is bluish. You see that will show you the presence that there is blood inside here. Okay, if you check our our fellow people who've got uh, skins where you can easily visualize things, you can check for a Cullen sign which is just usually above the umbilical, umbilicus. Or you can also check for the tenor sign. You tell your patient to lie on the side. You usually check here. You can see there will be bluish color showing you that there is some sort of hemoperitoneum. Okay? So the symptoms, I'm not going to go through them. All the symptoms are uh, on how to diagnose in terms of symptom, in terms of physical exam, that will come on its own as a lecture, clinical management of an ectopic pregnancy, that will come on its own, where I will talk about all that. 
This is just a broad overview of an ectopic pregnancy. So you can check for all those. You can check for a Turner sign. You can check for a Cullen sign. Okay. So now, now let's say uh, your patient comes in with ectopic pregnancy. Okay. Let's say your patient comes in with an ectopic pregnancy. Now, always in terms of management, you always need to do your ABCs. Okay. Your patient comes in if it is an acute ectopic pregnancy if patient your patient has got an acute ectopic pregnancy you are going to do your resuscitation but your resuscitation will go hand in hand with operative measures because when, what i mean by acute ectopic pregnancy someone who comes in in shock they are pale They've got cold extremities, their pulse rate is high, their BPs are low. These patients you need to resuscitate. Push that IV access, push the fluids, okay? Draw that blood for cross match so that you, you give your patient blood, rush your patient to theater and close the tap. Close the tap. Remember if the tap is open, water will keep flowing. Close the tap, take your patient to theater, close that tap, okay? That is for acute ectopic. But if it is a chronic, on the other hand, if you look at chronic ectopic pregnancy, it's simply that ectopic, which may be ruptured, but it formed a hematoma, but your patient remains chronically ill. But when you open the abdomen, you find that it ruptured a long time. So you say, ah, no, this patient had a chronic ectopic pregnancy. Or you can have what we call an unruptured ectopic pregnancy. So let's say, let's say for practical purposes for this lecture, let's say our patient has got, uh, let's say our patient has got a, a non-ruptured ectopic pregnancy. So how are we going to manage them? So we ask ourselves, am I going the medical way or am I going the surgical route? Okay, am I going the medical route or am I going the surgical route? So for you to be able to go through the medical route, number one. For you, for you to make that decision, you should ensure that your patient is asymptomatic. They are hemodynamically stable and they can comply to care. Here in Africa, uh, patients normally don't, can't manage to afford the medication used to treat ectopic pregnancies, which is methotrexate. Like here in Zambia, when you talk about 1,500 kwacha for methotrexate, it is very expensive. Our patients can't manage that. As a result, we usually go the surgical route most of the times. Okay? So if your patient can afford to comply with the, the care, which is the medication, and also the follow-ups, the serial beta SCG, because as we do them from private labs, we are not so we are not so privileged like our friends who've got it, who can easily do it in their uh, in their hospitals as we take it to private lab and private labs are usually very expensive so if you go if they can comply to doing a serial beta SCG you can they are hemodynamically stable they are asymptomatic you can try the medical route so if you're going to try the medical route there is a medication that we normally use okay we usually use what we call mm, methotrexate okay so now let me take you back to biochemistry okay let me take you back to biochemistry before I talk about methotrexate. Your body usually makes an inactivated folic acid, which is known as dihydrofolate. Okay, so this dihydrofolate is usually converted to tetrahydrofolate via an enzyme known as dihydrofolate reductase. Okay, so now the tetrahydrofolate is the active form of folic acid. So once folic acid has been activated, it will start now to synthesize purines and pyrimidines. And these purines and pyrimidines are the ones now that will start synthesizing proteins, the DNAs and the RNAs. Okay? So now, if you give methotrexate, it competes with the enzyme, with this enzyme known as the dihydrofolate reductase. Hence, blocking the conversion of dihydrofolate to tetrahydrofolate if there's no to tetrahydrofolate if there's no tetrahydrofolate there is no uh purines and pyramid and pyramid synthesis and hence there will be no dna rna and protein synthesis as a result your ectopic will start to shrink now what you need to understand is that methotrexate usually 
goes for any rapidly progressing cell. E.g. your bone marrow, your lungs, uh, your intestines. All those areas with rapidly progressing cells, methotrexate would easily attack them. That's why usually, whenever we are giving methotrexate, we usually add folinic acid. So today I'll give methotrexate, tomorrow I give folinic acid. The following day I give methotrexate, the other day I give folinic acid. We give them on alternate days. That's how we manage these patients, okay? To try and reduce the effect of methotrexate in other areas where it's not supposed to origin the bone marrow, the lungs, and also the what? And also the intestines and all those things, okay? So this is what methotrexate will do. It will block everything. So now, what are some of the absolute contraindications of methotrexate? Hemodynamic instability, liver and kidney abnormalities, uh, acute lung diseases, somebody who is breastfeeding, somebody who is unable to comply to care, these patients, these patients who fall in this group, never, I repeat, never start methotrexate. Go for surgical management. These are absolute contraindications. On the other hand, on the relative contraindications, we have got uh, fetal cardiac. Uh, if, if you've got fetal cardiac activity, it's just an absolute. You can try. You can try another Brexit, or you may not. Okay? If the beta SCG is greater than 500, 5,000, yeah, um, I'll try. I'll try another Brexit and see whether it will go down or not. Okay? And then if the ectopic is larger than me, 3.5 centimeters but not ruptured, you can also try. These are, that's why you call it a relative. You can weigh yourself. You can weigh whether you go the surgical route or the medical route. Okay? Now, if you go the surgical route, I remember asking a certain student, so, if you're going to go the surgical route, what are you going to do for this patient? And then he just told me, like, no, I'll just do an extra. That's all. Inside the extra, what are you going to do? He doesn't even know what he's going to do. So, exploratory laparotomy is simply, you are just opening the abdomen, right? But once you open the abdomen, that's why it's called exploratory. You are exploring the abdomen to see where is the problem. So it can be used as a diagnostic tool or it can be used a, as a curative, okay? Some some other people, they usually do uh, laparoscopic surgeries, okay? Those with the advanced technologies, they can go for laparoscopic surgeries, but as we usually do an exploratory laparotomy, you open the abdomen, okay? Once you open the abdomen, you find the, the ectopic. What are you going to do on the, by when you're opening the abdomen, we say you're exploring. That's why we say an exploratory laparotomy. But where after you explore the abdomen, you find the, the problem. Let's say you have found it it's here. You're going to do either two things. You're going to do either a salpingectomy where you remove the whole fallopian tube. Now here, when you remove, when you remove the whole fallopian tube, you look at this thing I've put for you here. There is no need of a follow-up beta ECG. Okay? Because you have removed everything. But when, on the other hand, if you go in and just do uh, a, a salpingostomy, you just remove the ectopic on the other hand, and then you switch it back. Number one, you don't know whether you have removed everything. Okay? Since you don't know whether you have removed everything, these are patients where you need to do uh, a serial beta ECG to see whether really you removed everything. Okay? So now, after we have discussed all this, this ends my lecture. For those interested in my live, my live lectures, these are my numbers. Okay, these are my numbers. I usually take live lectures and I, I will be posting and this is my email address if you've got a specific topic that you would like me to educate you on. These are my numbers. And again, don't forget my dear friends, if you like my content, please press the subscribe button. I'll see you again in the next lecture. Thank you very much and may God bless you.